in the macro regional strategies, we are dealing with uh, a little bit more long term things of a strategic importance, of the uh, development importance, which are not immediately seen. But if we do not share what we do, regardless of how hard we work, regardless of how successful we are with our results, if we do not share those results, if we are not able to communicate, they are simply not visible. And this is true for all four macro-regional strategies. Each of it is somehow struggling with the issue of the communication. How to communicate, what to communicate, and how to attract the interest of the, of the others. So last year, one of these recommendations was to um, to formulate, to set up a horizontal pillar for all four macro-regional strategies, that would be a pillar on media and communication. But it's easy to adopt the recommendation, more difficulties to implement it. So we volunteered as a Slovenia to organize first event in this uh, setup. And this is uh, to organize a conference for all four macro-regional uh, strategies where we, the intention is to actually bring together two distinct worlds, the world of media and the world of the macro-regional strategies, to meet each other, to get to know each other, to share the knowledge and experience from each other, and to make friends. And as a result, we sincerely hope with the joint efforts, we will improve our communication skills and the visibility of all our efforts. And this brings us to already to the first part of our, our uh, conference. This is actually the first panel discussing the media in today's society. Not to forget, also this year, we would like to make the recommendations and to share those recommendations for better management of the macro-regional strategies, in particular focused on media and communication, with the countries and regions participating in macro-regional strategies, but also with European institutions. And saying European institutions, we need to know that we all member states are part of those institutions, so it's also for the national decision uh, makers too. We would not like that this conference is one off single event. We just say we had the conference, tick, and we go home. Have a nice time and that's it. Now we consider this conference more as a starting point of a, something more long term, more systematic, a regular, periodic assessment evaluation, where we are on our way on a communication and where we are with the progress toward the common goals that we set to, to each other. Um, <clears throat> and here we are to understand how the media is working. This is our first panel. And uh, I have a special pleasure to present to you the first keynote speaker who actually did participate and work with us, well, it's almost one year, I would say, in discussing all this subject and helping us, the ministry, who is not very skillful in the media and communication part. Uh, this we see from a number of criticism normally, uh, which are in the media of what we do and how we do. Uh, so actually we did ask the help of those who really are masters of the, of the business. So Mr. Marko Milosavljevic, who is our first keynote speaker, is basically associate professor of the chair of journalism of the Faculty of Social Sciences of the University of Ljubljana. He is also a member of the core experts group for media and culture, which is advising to the European Commission. 
He's also a chairman of a number of international boards and associations, everything dealing with media and communication, and without doubt, he's a, an expert in the field. So Marco, please, floor is yours to introduce us to the media world of today's. Thank you. Hello, also from me. Um, I am your first keynote speaker, and I'm also one of the people who are involved in and decided in the, this uh, headline of knowing thy neighbor and explaining now, trying to explain here why I believe that this is important also from the media perspective and what the role of media in this can be. Uh, now, I'll start with a picture. Um, a few years ago, the you, U.S. headquarters in Afghanistan were asked to explain the situation in Afghanistan at the press conference. And they promised that they will prepare an explanation of the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, and at the next press conference, they actually produced this picture. Uh, it is a picture that was, of course, so absurd that it became a viral hit uh, because it shows all the complexities and troubles uh, when you try to and the, the fact that you cannot explain a very complex situation with a single picture or, of course, with a single PowerPoint, and that's also one of my, um, my limitations today. But it also shows that today's questions are very often very complex. And I believe that the situation in EU right now is very complex. I believe that the situation among neighbors is very complex, and, of course, the future either of EU or, of course, regions within the EU is quite a complex. And we need to have a lot of knowledge and we need to have a lot of understanding and that's where the media comes in. Uh, so, we need to have some data, but the data is not in itself enough. We need to have information. The data is the raw basics where we come to understand and we, when we grasp it, we have some sort of information. Then, when we have enough of information, but also some background, we can have a context and only Afterwards, we can have an understanding. Uh, and there are, of course, this is relevant also for the national politics, EU politics, or for regional aspects. Um, now, why is that, the, so to speak, a problem? Um, it's a problem because we're living in a world where we have enormous amount of data. Never before has then been, there been so much data, especially not digitalized. We have pictures, we have videos, we have all sort of access to all sort of files, uh, statistics, and so on. And yet, we have problems with understanding. We have problems of digesting that and getting to some sort of relevant information. And this is a nice quote from Ray Bradbury 70 years ago. He wrote, of course, in his famous book, Fahrenheit 451, a warning about the society that does not think enough, that is reduced to entertainment and where, as he said, everything is reduced to a few sentences, everything is reduced to perhaps a paragraph or two, um, and the things just whirl around and people just don't uh, have the time or, or willingness to actually to go into anything more complex. We know probably more about the, not just the winner of Big Brother, but any participant in Big Brother or The Voice or X Factor. We tend to know and we probably know more than we do about many aspects, for example, of EU policy. We are full of different things and we do get a lot of these things also from the media. We get all the details about certain dresses or about certain dinners or who, which footballer is dating whom and so on. But in the end, what we get is people are full of incompatible data and they get so full of facts, they feel stuffed, but absolutely they feel like they're brilliant in information while in fact they have very little clue what is happening. So then they will feel that they, are, they will feel that they are thinking, not actually thinking, They'll get a sex of, uh, sense of motion, and they'll be happy because facts of that don't change. Don't give them any slippery stuff like philosophy or sociology to tie things up. That way lies melancholy. I come from Faculty of Social Sciences, so that is my sort of sarcastic joke about the uh, things that we do. And of course, his famous warning about the future of which involves lack of thinking is also, of course, that in this future, predicted 70 years ago, there were no newspapers left. Nobody 
no, not just that they died, but they died without people even missing them or noticing that they are gone. Similar things and similar thoughts were expressed by George Orwell and Aldous Huxley. And I'm intentionally quite wide in this scope because I don't want to go too narrowly into just particular journalistic issues uh, and practical, let's say, recommendations what should be done. Because we, as a society, very often don't think about the wider picture. But we would need to do that. When we want to change something in the media, it's not just the media that would need to change. It is the society, it's the education system, it is the values that we produce in a different institutions. This is, a, this is not a new uh, issue of the book, but it's a nice joke that says that actually a lot of these problems are seen also in 2017, and not just in 1984. So Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Actually, Huxley feared the truth would be drowned. There would be no need to hide it. It would be out there, but nobody would look at it. It would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Starving for wisdom. Uh, it, and everybody is sometimes blaming or often blaming also the new media or also many other factors. Uh, there is an old story from Socrates about uh, God Theos and the Egyptian king Tamus, uh, where he talked about these new technologies and what can be done with new technologies, how they can be used or misused. And the uh, God Theos said, here is an accomplishment which will improve the wisdom. I have discovered a sure receipt for memory and wisdom. Uh, invention of writing. And Tamus replied, this will, be, will have the opposite of its real function. Those who acquire it will cease to exercise their memory and become forgetful. Did anybody mention Google? How many phone numbers of your friends do you still know today? Do you, do you, are you, re, do you remember the days when we had to memorize their numbers? And today, we, we believe that everything is either in a, in a phone or on Google and so on. We become forgetful. They will rely on writing. What you have discovered is a receipt for recollection, but not for memory. And Ed Postman added to that that we have to negotiate with the technology. Uh, and it's a problem how we use that technology in a positive way or in a negative way. About the responsibility of Google, Facebook, Twitter for so many things. Just these days, in the last few days, there were new proposals of laws where they would be responsible, for example, if somebody is posting something out there, for example, about crime or about uh, children and so on, so they would become responsible for the content. Okay? So there are all these new ideas what to do with them uh, in good way and in bad way. Of course, look at the relation between the European Commission and Google and also Facebook regarding regulation of many aspects. The questions of fake news. Um, is truth dead? Is it still relevant? Uh, is, is something that media publishes, is it still as relevant as it used to be? Do people stu still go to the media to look for the truth? If you look at the recent polls by different research centers in, throughout the world, if you ask people uh, where do they get their information, most of the people say Facebook. But it's, of course it's not actually Facebook that produces that content. People are simply sharing something from some media outlet, more or less, or perhaps some blogger or so on. But people believe that Facebook is the the one that spreads either the truth or information, uh, forgetting that actually there are some media that still tries to get out of the truth, check the facts, uh, do the reporting and the research. This is a nice quote. Please read it until the end. Perhaps it, perhaps it wasn't Abraham Lincoln, of course. But it's ob sometimes the fake news is obvious. Sometimes it's less obvious. But yes, we tend to share a lot of that without even thinking twice. According to data from Twitter, about 30% of retweets are about the tweets that people never even opened. They just see something from someone, see perhaps the, something a little bit, and then they immediately spread around. They don't even read it. So the issues of digitalization for the contemporary society, and of course then for the EU, and of course for the role of uh, ministries and journalists and media and so on. 
Uh, we had a discussion with my colleague Dennis Ashtir just a few days ago, and uh, actually I prepared this presentation a little bit before that, and I'm saying that digitalization is on one hand the best thing that has happened to journalism, and on the other hand it's the worst thing that has happened to media and their business model, uh, particularly the old uh, media. And also, of course, for the society, um, what do we get out of that? Are we like Socrates believing in good aspects of new technology or bad? What do we have today? The old saying from British Prime Minister was that the media has power without responsibility. We are discussing this again and again today when Facebook refuses to acknowledge any sort of responsibility for a lot of things that are happening on Facebook. We know here in Slovenia there was a murder that was broadcasted live on Facebook Live and although it was reported 20 or 30 times to Facebook, Facebook took more than 13 hours to took it down. A live broadcast of a murder. Um, there is power without responsibility for sure. Why this is good, bad for business models, just a look at how, uh, how some of these companies are functioning and this is actually uh, from uh, one year ago, but you can have a just the impression that the big ones are really big ones, but everybody else is really, really small and tiny compared to those uh, enormous companies and very difficult to compete with them. Then we have the small regions, small countries. I don't know if you see that. Do you see it well enough on this picture? Yeah. There, this is a, actually an <laughs> ad for, for a bank called HSBC, which says more people ride New York City buses every day than live in Slovenia. <laughs> of course. We have a number of small countries in the region. We have small regions in the bigger countries. The media functions throughout the, through the economy of scale. And if you have these small markets, of course, it's much more difficult to function through the market model. So that's why I'm looking back at something called social responsibility theory of press. It's not from Russia or Soviet Union, although it sounds a bit like that today. Uh, people say media have no responsibility, there should be no responsibility, etc. They are just market uh, companies and so on. This is actually something that was uh, discussed after the Second World War in US. And there was a commission on the freedom of press that produced a number of important reports, including a free and responsible press that was discussed by Theodore Pearson and Wilbur Schramm in their four theories of media. And they talked about the social responsibility which is mm, probably more relevant today than it was 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Uh, when we see that uh, within the small markets, we, we see all the ma market failures and limitations. Uh, I did a research for London School of Economics on the, the small markets in, throughout the region, also some larger uh, markets throughout the EU. They simply cannot function normally or fully just based on a market model. There is just not enough audience, the languages are small, uh, in a number of countries the GDP is also small, etc. So the pure market model cannot simply function, even within the wealthiest countries. In smaller countries and in uh, not so rich countries as somewhere, let's say, in Western Balkans uh, or some other places, their limitations are even stronger. So we see that there should be some sort of role of the state or regional authorities and, of course, uh, the awareness of the public uh, of these issues, uh, the support for the media. Uh, we often have also a lot of problems with copyright. We often have a lot of problems with piracy, etc. And so we will need to have a look again at the something that, again, not a... Eastern European, but American author Gandhi talked about it already 40 years ago, information subsidies, not just from PR companies, PR agencies, but also related to the national media policies, EU media policy, uh, and regional policies, and of course, the decisions by the media themselves. And have a look at something that happened yesterday in the US. I'm not talking about, again, about Russia I'm not, or Soviet Union. I'm not talking about socialism or other things. I've been this weekend in, in London at a conference with Ofcom. They are more re regulating the media more than ever before. 
telling the media what they can do and what they cannot do, including online audiovisual things on demand. Uh, they have new power over BBC and so on. It is a conservative party, but so supposedly in favor of liberal approach, and yet when it comes to the media, they have a very strong policy. And this is news from yesterday from US that the report for America, a, a project, a foundation that will be financed by a number of contributors uh, is planning to have um, 1,000 additional journalists in the next five years in local newsrooms. They emphasize the importance of local media and local newsrooms for the, for the public benefit, for the public purpose of people having good access to the information and to the relevant information about their environment. So again, it is something that we can, of course, also think and look for perhaps future actions in Slovenia, in the region, and of course at the European level. Why don't we have this sort of projects? Why don't we have this sort of funding? Not necessarily for the media, perhaps for the journalists, perhaps for the newsroom, for different sort of, uh, for different sort of maintenance of the diversity and, of course, plurality of the landscape that we have, which is particularly problematic at the regional level where we already have a small number of offerings. So, at the end, I want to remember this old cartoon, the, the, I think it's called Ugly Coyote, something, something like that, uh, and Roadrunner, and so on. Uh, and if you remember from a number of other cartoons, they often run and they still run, although they are above some sort of abyss or something, you know, running on in air. They run and they only realize that there is a problem when they stop. <laughs> and sometimes the media and politics in EU and in particular countries, and I will not mention any particular country, but we discussed that a little bit before, we have a lot of politicians who don't think a few steps ahead. They just look at what step ahead. We also have a lot of media looking only at their daily ratings or daily clicks, but not what they are developing throughout the months and years uh, of what they are distributing. Uh, we need to think a little bit in advance, because otherwise we might find out that we have gone too far and we are actually standing upon the abyss. Uh, this is a nice thought. You know, <laughs> we often produce the news for itself. We need to fill up all the space that is available. We need to have all that. Sometimes there is not a lot of news. And yet, when it comes to very often to regional topics, there is often this excuse, well, we don't cover that because we don't have time. You're not that popular. It's not that relevant. It's not that clickable or etc. There is time. There is space. We need a little bit of thinking. Perhaps we won't say that there is no news today. Media will never, of course, say that there is no news today. We realize sometimes there is not a lot of very important things going on. Let's give the space and time to some things that are not bloody enough to be on the front page, but still deserve our attention. Otherwise, we'll end up like this coyote. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm now giving the floor to my esteemed colleague, Boris Bergant, who will host our next panel. Distinguished colleague, Marco, for this, uh, I would say, interesting uh, challenge for our discussion. It was uh, a lot of uh, data and a lot of statements, but it was also, I think, a uh, tour d'horizon, which uh, gave us some bullet points for our own discussion. Um, and I would just like to, to uh, let you know how I would like to run this uh, discussion we have. We have on disposal, if I understood well, 100 minutes. Uh, we would like actually to divide that in four parts. One uh, introductory part would um, have something to do with uh, comments on what uh, Marco has said, whether we all agree or disagree or we have second thoughts on that. 
Uh, but the aim is, of course, um, if we want to do something in, in our neighborhood, we have also to know in what environment we are uh, moving and what has actually changed, and it changed tremendously, the media sphere. Uh, the, the, the second part um, uh, we would devote is, um, is um, uh, maybe more concrete uh, um, drilling in the phenomenon of the linear, non-linear, of digital, which was mentioned, um, of social media, fake news, credibility, and so on. This also involves uh, our attention because uh, we are at stake. The third would be uh, where we would reach the uh, item of the conference, uh, the distinguished uh, situation between global, regional, local, what can be done, what can be improved, how we can uh, learn from each other, and we have some good examples and we would like to show you. And of course the last one, I would say some ideas, some suggestions, some predictions, for what can be done, what should be done. So, um, I would very quickly like to introduce our distinguished guests. You have it in the booklet, but I think we owe our attention. Uh, first, here is uh, our distinguished uh, friend from France, Sonia Dolezal Stolper. She is a correspondent of the third largest uh, French newspaper, Liberation, but correspondent from United Kingdom and Ireland, uh, traditional, I would say, competitor of France. Um, uh, but she must be, in these days, I would say, an expert of Brexit, and also of a question which is very much uh, related to regional and uh, local, and which we always forget, and this is the situation between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, or Republic of Ireland, and I think we should discuss a little bit because that will give us also some ideas what is at stake. Um, um, Sonia graduated from Ecole Supérieure de Journalisme in Lille. We have had uh, quite a number of contacts with this school, very good one. And uh, just to say something about her, she started to work with Agence France Press, so she has experience in all sorts of journalism, and is frequently, of course, as a correspondent from the United Kingdom, uh, appearing not only in French media, but also in British media. Welcome. And she's first time in Slovenia. Welcome again. Our distinguished guest from Croatia, Inoslav Beškar, uh, is not only a very prominent, I would say one of the most respected Croats and Croatian journalists, but also, let me say so, one of the most educated. He is not only professor of communication, sciences, but also of philology. He uh, is or has lectures on the universities of Bologna, Naples, La Sapienza in Rome, and of course Zagreb, Split, Dubrovnik. He was correspondent of Jesnik, Uternilist and Slobodna Dalmatia from Italy, writes columns for Globus, got the most prestigious Croat award for life achievements in journalism, Otto Kershovani, and is an expert <coughs> of Vatican maybe also very useful for our discussion. <laughs> a lady next to him is a representative of younger generation of journalists in Slovenia, uh, Vanya Grigorovic. Uh, um, sh she has started as journalist of a famous uh, medium attracting youth, students, and critical intellectuals, radio student is contributing for dailies uh, Neunik and weekly Mladina. But recently, and I am very proud and uh, glad, she is involved in the investigative journalism in my own house, a very interesting project, Extravisor, data investigation. And I think investigative journalism is in general, uh, I would say, a way of performing journalism for the future. And um, uh, I'm very glad that she will uh, give us her aspects of uh, these matters. And uh, the distinguished colleague who replaced uh, um, 
uh, Madame uh, Slokan, very welcome, is Denis Ostir. Uh, he is editor-in-chief of Digital Assets of ProPlus, but also the Slovenian largest website. And I think it would be good that we discuss a little bit these open questions, web uh, openness, uh, closeness, and so on. So, uh, let's start. Mm, um, Sonia, we have here uh, had a good uh, challenge from Marco. He was uh, comparing Orwell and Huxley. Uh, two, I would say, uh, extremes. Uh, what do you fear more, Orwell or Huxley? <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I think I would say that I fear right now more Huxley, but that would be because I've been living... Over here. Yes, but it's main, mainly because I've been, as you were saying, covering the Brexit story a story or saga or circus as ever you you want to call it for the last year and a half and um, i i genuinely think that that the result of the referendum in uh, in uh, the uk was mainly led by that amount of information which actually weren't information there were lies or fake news as you call them now or approximation and and that led to a vote which was clearly not what anyone, including from the Leave side, were expecting. And it leads us today in a situation where it's a complete chaos and uh, they don't really know how to negotiate that uh, decision. Um, I think mainly maybe what I could add is as well there is some big specificity in the British press, I think, where the British press, press has got a, a huge responsibility is the fact that the pluralism of that press is actually very tiny because you've got on one side the tabloid press, which would be the Sun, the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, which would feed complete lies days after days. And then what we call the broadsheet papers, so that the, uh, the Guardian, the the, the Financial Times, the Times and the Daily Telegraph um, actually probably didn't do their job as much as they should have done it. So they didn't question as much as they should have. They are now beginning to do it, which is um, in a way completely mad if you think about it because it's too late. The decision has been taken. So here we are, I think, for now. Thank you very much. In Oslo, we are similar generation. In our lifetime, actually, everything happened with media, particularly electronic <coughs> media. I mean, uh, uh, but still, uh, having in mind what uh, Marco has pointed out and uh, also given in a bullet point uh, uh, form, what would you say, uh, how changed actually the media uh, in, in, let's say, recent decades, and particularly in the last one. What is the, 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 the biggest change in, in, in your assessment as a professional journalism? Uh, or better to say, you still think that journalism is a profession of the future? I have an ethical problem. When I speak to the fresh students of the journalism in Dubrovnik, uh, I must tell, I am obliged to tell them that they are entering in a profession which is dying, in the profession which uh, will not feed themselves and their families, that they are going in a precarious way of life where, they, are, uh, where, they, are be, where they will be responsible for the loss of the possibilities for their children. And that's a problem. That's a, and, uh, that's a really ethical problem. On the other side, I am sure, I'm positive that the journalism is going to survive in a certain way because the information is needed and uh, there is a need of information as a, not only virtual, but uh, how to say, a life enemy of this information of uh, fake news, of alternative uh, alternative uh, truth, etc. So, um, I think uh, from one side, we saw 
the moving from the from the printed press to television and then from television to new media uh, we have seen uh, how to say a revival of a written discourse in uh, in internet instead of only of the video only video and uh, toward the multimedia but the content is always the same what we can do for instance uh, three or four days ago a uh, known publisher in Italy Mr. De Benedetti uh, said that the uh, new media uh, especially not new media but um, social uh, social nets uh, to pay for the for the deepening in the press uh, in the in the printed journalism uh, I'm not sure that this is a very simple. But on the other side, I wouldn't like to see the state as a transmitter, as Marco spoke before, because I'm, I've seen some states during my life, and every day I'm more afraid of them, especially in the relation with the, with the journalism. If they pay us, they want to know what we are, what we are writing about and how we are writing about. Uh, that uh, produces some chills on my on my skin. So maybe maybe the great uh, possibilities which uh, new ways of communications open will bring us to the more responsible responsible uh, relation to the to the information. But this do not begin and this do not end with the, with the journalists and with the media. It begins and ends in education, in home education, in the school education, and especially in what we've forgotten, we have forgotten, and it's a, a civil education, education for a, for a civil society. Thank you very much. Vanya, you are next generation, younger generation, and what we are actually facing uh, is on one hand side, a total change of paradigm uh, from written press to electronic and digital on one side. But I would be afraid of another uh, problem that youngsters are actually, it is reported, not reading, not hearing uh, at all. They get their information somewhere. Uh, we will uh, discuss later with Dennis. Uh, from, from um, well, online, but I mean, in reality, this old type of uh, um, publishing uh, things doesn't exist anymore. Is it a problem that the modern means, which means not only written press, but also, let's say, electronic press, have not uh, taken consideration about the, the, the change of paradigm of youngsters, uh, you know, taking news in a different way because we don't service them properly? Uh, or is it something else? How do you see uh, the situation? I mean, how you are informing yourself? Well, well I, I, I would say that maybe that's not quite correct because we, we are like and me and my peers are like informing ourselves all, all the time maybe that is not like this what you would all consider as news but as you told me before the, uh, what was the most important news today was uh, Kim Kardashian sunscreen or sunlight or something like that yeah uh, that is uh, that is maybe uh, a problem um, uh, but yeah, we are constantly like getting information uh, from different sources. Uh, those are not maybe like printed, uh, printed uh, news or uh, something like. Like uh, we can choose from, like all the different media from the world that you know we can get online from. I don't know. As Azerbaijan media or something like that to, to uh, yeah. So it's not that like there is a, there is maybe a decrease in this local media that uh, I mean like state media that that we um, consume, but but we do just like some others, and we are not I would say like really faithful uh, consumers. 
every time like we pick something else what is like different uh, uh, what uh, our interests are you know so uh, if when I was uh, interested in what is happening in Venezuela, I, I tried to find some like local media, media that is covering like from there, not not to to wait for like seven o'clock news uh, on television to see what the journalist from Slovenia that just read some press releases or uh, like press agencies will tell me. Mm, so. I, I don't know, maybe this, yeah. But, but can, can I uh, yeah. add the question? Yes, please. Exactly, I, I feel the same. People are looking all over, but then Huxley comes, comes with this overkill. Yeah. But the point is that the, the following, um, it is a question of literacy, of media literacy. Uh, we elder generations have some problems. Literacy. Yes. Literacy in general, yes. But I mean, the elder generations had some time in this uh, transition period uh, problems with adopting new media and uh, electronic media. But you youngsters, you since birth, you, you are already taping and, and searching and so on. But how can you distinct between uh, uh, credible information and uncredible? Do you think that with your new generation's media literacy, you can do it, or you are in doubt? Well, <laughs> like, at first glance, I would think, like, we don't even give it much thought to it, but then again, uh, you can never be sure, but, but you're not reliable on only one source of information, so you get your whole picture, like, from different information, different news sources. And maybe, maybe then you can, like, this is maybe even more credible than, you know, your media that you, like, as a senior generation, did. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry? No, it's okay. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> uh, that is why, like, I, uh, like, younger generation, we, we think that internet is actually more um, credible. It, but internet as a, as a whole. So, as I said before, you can get your picture uh, of, a, of some event or some issue from like different parts. Not, not the television, not the printed media, who have like maybe some political background uh, or, or some other agenda. They learned us also not not to trust like this classical classical. Uh, they taught us uh, not to trust classical media. So we. Um, yeah, this is uh, just it. Sorry. May I say something? Yeah. Yes, yeah. of course, distinguished uh, 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 Dennis. I w would like, first of all, that you comment because you are coming from such a media. But on the other hand, I would also, since you are coming from a, a commercial broadcaster and we have this division between public and commercial and so on, is it at all a question of future in, in media, uh, this division of uh, business models? public broadcasting, commercial broadcasting, uh, or is it another paradigm underway? This, that would be my, my question for the beginning, commenting on that. And, but the second also, how do you see where, where we are going and where we are, so to say, uh, orienting ourselves? Uh, are nowadays this, distinguish, uh, this, this, uh, this separation between written press and electronic press at all uh, any more important because everybody is electronic, everybody is digital. We are hearing the new processes that the written press will dis extinguish, so to say. Everything from, from print uh, uh, media will go online because it's uh, more uh, universal, it is cheaper. Uh, I know I'm getting, for instance, uh, several newspapers. Some of them are already uh, extinguishing the, the delivery over the borders because it's too expensive to send paper over the borders. So uh, I would be interesting for the first round that you also comment these uh, uh, business models and so on. Are we really uh, slaves of these old models? That is first thing. And the second thing, where do you see regarding the technology, the, the future of media? Uh, if I address the first question that you had regarding the, the uh, transport mechanism, this is not an, a new issue. Um, it's been happening for, I'm guessing, like 4,000 years. Um, the Egyptians 
were probably the first ones that put something in hieroglyphs. That was journalism. They were relaying information. Uh, then the, um, I'm guessing the marathon runner was a journalist, right? He was relaying information. He took a piece of information, ran somewhere, and told that information on. Um, then came the written word, then came the digital word. The transport mechanisms in which the word or the information has moved has evolved for 4,000 years, or even more, I'd say like a, a million years, ever since the, human, the, the person was able to think and try to relay the information to someone else. So, however, we are right now at a point where journalism has become a business and the media as a business have supported journalism. And now the media being threatened, journalism is being under threat. So I'm thinking the, the, the transport mechanism is not that big of an issue. Right now, as, as people have access to information and channels to get that information from, media and journalists especially have the same access to the same audience. It's a two-way process. It's not like, you know, we always say that right now people have access to all sorts of world media. Well, guess what? The world media has access to the exact same viewers. So it's not, it's not about, um, it's mostly about sticking back to the, or grasping on to old business models and old models of doing things. It's in human nature. We would like to do things have the way we've done them for 100 years, but we're at a point where this is no longer working. We've become equals with our readers. We're no longer the only ones possessing the power to address um, our audience. We're not the only ones that have the power to provide the information to them under the, um, I would say under the, uh, the rules that we set, we're not the ones that say, you know what, seven o'clock in the evening, stop whatever you're doing, you're gonna be watching TV and we're gonna tell you what, what we think is the most important news of the day. It's an evolving process and I think journalism right, journalists right now have an enormous opportunity to, if, if they wanna be journalists, I'm talking about journalists, the person that relays the information and puts the information in context for the audience. They've never had the potential to reach the amount of people in an easiest possible way than they have right now. The biggest problem is how to pay for them. That is what, what we need to figure out. And this comes to the second point of the public versus the private. We all have the same problem. However, I think private or commercial media is, might be slightly more on the negative side of the curve. Uh, we are still journalists. We are aware of what our role is, is to educate and inform people and we are not, I'm not covering our eyes, it's our role also to slightly entertain them, that is, that is true. We are all trying to address the same audience. I'm thinking the line will probably dis even become less relevant than it is right now. I mean, right now, currently, we finished the European Championships, which was covered on a commercial TV station. It would normally be covered on a, on a publicly uh, owned TV station. It was done with us, and it's, I'm, I'm thinking it's, it's not all that dire. I'm thinking the only big thing is right now is we need to figure out how to get out of the mess of letting people think that content gets created for free, that it doesn't cost anything to create a piece of content, which is quality journalism. And it's also one thing I would like to address. Everyone's talking about fake news, fake news, fake news. Fake news is not a new phenomenon. You know, let's be honest, I've worked in this business for 20 years, there's some distinguished guests here that have been working for 40 years. Fake news has been going on, like, for ages. I mean, politicians have tried to manipulate the media for ages. They've established their own TV stations, their own radio stations, their own newspapers, and they've all tried to manipulate with the audience. The challenge right now is that the, the, ex, the, the, the way fake news can reach audiences has become exponentially more rapid. We are, I'm talking about back, coming back to the first point, being journalism. Maybe it's about time we start asking ourselves, what is the role of journalism in a society right now? Uh, instead of just being the carrier of information which has been commoditized, information is everywhere. I think we need to finally realize and say, you know what? We should be focusing more on the fact that we are becoming a curator of content and a curator of information and the person that puts the information in context for the viewer. Just to brief things that I agree with, uh, with Anya that a number of things regarding the new media is actually better grasped by younger people and uh, we should be thinking more about not just media literacy but other things for, for actually mature audience. Uh, although mature audience is usually looking at the younger as the ones who don't understand that there is fake news and, uh, and this sort of things. 
just look at the, let's say, different rules of the new media. Um, if you look at the, now there are new workshops and so on and conferences, for example, video and how the way video is produced for online. And because it's produced for not just for online, but most of the online is consumed on mobile phones, it needs to be produced differently, which means that it needs to be produced vertically instead of horizontally. Um, the, the picture cannot be from a far away, it needs to be really directly in your face and so on. And that is something that younger people, of course, understand because they already use it like that. We had a recent conference when somebody was telling, yeah, the picture because of the Instagram should be more square-like and so on. Of course, that is something that older editors don't understand. The younger people all know that. They know that in the world of Instagram, the most popular food is avocado because it's most picturesque. And I haven't seen any, any uh, popular Instagram photo of beans of pasul or, or, or goulash or something like that because it's not photo photogenic. And younger people just don't uh, just understand that. If, if I may, and one thing, they have, there's an avocado emoji. There's an emoji of an avocado. That's proofs of how popular it is. Mm -hmm. And just the second thing is just one sentence when you're talking about the change and the need to change. I, I recently saw a very good example and, or illustration of that, and I would like to ask you, I'm not f in favor of any sort of motivation uh, workshops or, or stuff like that, but I will ask you to simply cross your arms like the way Boris is already doing. So please, can you just cross your arms? everybody. And now can you please cross them but the other way around. Some people change it easily. A lot of people do when they cross the arms they do it in a half a second. When they need to cross it the other way they need to think for two or three seconds. And that is the problem with the change and that's why I think that younger people have a tendency to change better. I agree. Uh, it's, uh, it's true that, for instance, the protocols of the elders of Zion uh, have more than 100 years of history, that uh, you can find them now on more than 2,000 sites all over the internet, but they are today less credible than then. Well, it's okay, it's okay. But the problem is, and Boris uh, illustrated it here now, in, uh, even in the public, on, the, on one side, we can produce journalists who will, be, who will be able to, uh, to give, uh, to produce uh, uh, deep analysis, but from the other side, how many people are looking for a different information for, uh, to look from the two, three, or more different points of view, or there, and how many of them are trying to find only a confirm of their own point of view. I think, uh, I think that we find uh, in our public when more than 70%, more, even more than 80% of the people who have their opinion before the information and who can achieve only those informations which, uh, which, uh, which confirm their convention. Yes, I think we are moving in the right direction and uh, to the right questions. Uh, uh, Sonia, I would like uh, uh, to drill a little bit more. Uh, Denis said, well, uh, uh, fake news existed all the time. I would add also propaganda journalism have been existing since ever. You remember this joke uh, when Brezhnev and Napoleon are discussing about press and uh, Napoleon was praising uh, Soviet press uh, for being really strict, saying that uh, if I would have such a press in France, they would never know that I lost all my uh, wars. No? Uh, so it is nothing new, but, but, uh, the, but the question, and you mentioned now the, the Brexit case, and we can mention uh, the, the victory of uh, Trump, and, 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 but it is a difference. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, all this uh, propaganda and fake news earlier have been slowly uh, dis distributed. Now we have an immediate effect which goes with the digi digital effect. Remember the Egyptian revolution, how it starts and how it ends. Tremendously bad. And it was uh, guilt of 
fake news, uh, manipulated news, and so on. So my question would be, is it any uh, medicine against that? Well, I'm actually quite optimistic. I'm the older or middle older generation or whatever, but I do teach some students and I get exactly the same because I do teach them just one week or two weeks of intensive course uh, in a year. And when I arrive, I'm always very stricken by the first thing they tell me is, I know, I chose the wrong job. I'm not going to be able to do my job properly. I'm not going to earn money and everything. And I keep saying, no, actually, you're wrong because you are getting into a profession which is completely changing right now, but which has a great future, I think, in front of you. And one of the things is what you are saying about journalism has existed uh, for the last 4,000 years. I think we need to be careful about the difference between communication and being able to reach and get all sorts of information and news and journalism, which I think is different from that, which is, yes, we relay information but we, and we are witness of, of what is happening, but we should be able to put that in perspective, to explain, to simplify if it needs to be simplified. And, uh, and to be a, a relay on that. I was thinking as well about what you were saying. The older generation used to read more broadsheet paper, material paper. The younger one is on internet all the time. Actually, it's true, but if you are you're going to think I'm obsessed by Brexit, which is probably absolutely true. I dream about Brexit uh, day and night. But anyway, the fact if, if you look at the data from the vote, the older generations, the one who are reading, voted, the over 65 voted overwhelmingly in favor of leaving. The younger generation, the less than 25 years old, voted overwhelmingly in favor of staying in the EU. The big difference was the young one, they voted less. And that's where I think probably us as journalists, we didn't do our job properly. Yes. Because we should have been able to explain that vote will have an impact on your future for the next generation, for your life, your children and everything. And you need to go and vote if you think that what they're proposing is not for you. And that we didn't, man I mean we, the British press at least, because it was in the British press and I think they didn't at all do that. So I think what you were saying, I think it's true, you are very well informed, the young generation is super well informed and we go back to what you were saying at the beginning is about education because I think when you're young you get all the information that's true, you go from one uh, news or whatever it is to another one where the problem lies and I think it's true for journalists, it's true for the young generation, it's true for institution, for the EU, for politics, is education and education from very, very early on. Being able to know that you need, it's great to go and see different news and different approach, but you need to question that. And that you can't learn how to question news if you don't learn that at school or very early on in your, in your education. And I think that has been again, again, um, I, I've done that little poll, you were doing that exercise of crossing your arms. I can't do that exercise here, but I do that with British audience. I keep asking them, well, actually, I could do that. So my question will be, who among all of you have had, while you were at school, at least a little bit of information of learning how does the European Union work, how it was born and how it functions, the institution, everything. Okay, not many, not many. In in Britain, when you ask the question, no one has had that education at all in Britain, at all. It is not in the curriculum at school. You learn how the United Kingdom has won two world war on their own, mainly. <laughs> You learn how many, I mean, you learn 10 times that Henry VIII uh, had quite a lot of, of wives and killed them and beheaded them and divorced them. You don't learn a thing about the European Union construction. So if you don't have that at all within your 17 years at school or 16 years at school, you can't expect that when you get in front of a vote asking about the European Union, people are going to be informed. So 
we go back to that. I think very important, we heard now this impact of education and the future, Vanya, but still I would drill and then in these general terms and then we would go into concrete. But it was a time a uh, few years ago when all these novelties became accessible, that people said, well, the, at, uh, Inosla, I think, mentioned uh, already that the profession of journalism will extinct. Uh, everybody is a journalist, everybody no. is a TV reporter, uh, we don't need uh, professionals and so on. Would you, after hearing that arguments and uh, comparing your own uh, experience, um, so to say, say uh, this is a very vague profession, or wouldn't you uh, accept uh, my thesis that I think in, in the ex existing moment and in the future, journalism will be even more important than it is today? What is your opinion? Yes, I also agree with you uh, because I went to study also because of this uh, idealistic uh, image of, of journalism like uh, as this investigative uh, uh, the guardian of, <laughs> I don't know, so um, in, in that matter it is. And, and it, it is also like very um, uh, solid. I, I, uh, and we will need that also in, in, in the future. But there are also like some other profession kind of jur also journalism or something like that that is mostly, uh, as you told before, also just to um, entertain or, or something like that. <laughs> but uh, I don't know about that, but I think like this true journalism that we will need it, and we do, and uh, I don't know, the, the project that we did, I, I don't want to brag or something, but uh, it also gave me a lot of hope, and uh, things like this, uh, we will... Yeah. Okay, uh, let's round up this, uh, this uh, macro view with the last question which uh, has been provoked uh, by Marco, and it is, okay, we now know uh, a lot is available, also in the uh, internet and so on, but uh, a lot is misused, of course, more and more. And since it is a big danger that all these propaganda effects and so on can provoke immediate effects, because earlier it took time before you know, people would digest and so on. Uh, uh, where actually um, are the limits? I mean, uh, Marcos uh, mentioned that there are a lot of political discussion. It should be somehow controlled. Some countries like China, but we see not only China, are uh, really influencing the flow of information in a very negative way. But uh, in your view, Dennis, uh, a practical man, uh, is it at all possible uh, to uh, limit uh, this flow of information or is it another solution which I mentioned earlier, uh, really profound, I would say genuine journalism? Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say? Oof. I, I'd say both. Uh, first of all, I would be very pleased if someone finally, I mean Facebook has been around for 15 years. Uh, Twitter's been around for 10 years. Snapchat's been around for four years. It, I mean, Twitter's about to die, and right now we're talking about how to regulate hate speech on Twitter. Uh, it takes ages for regulation to catch up with the rapid development of social networks. Um, it would be very wise for, first of all, people that do regulation to use and understand how it works, how it's very, very fast, how it's, how it's done on a completely different premise than uh, than traditional media, so they would be able to regulate it. I am a proponent not of regulation, but of these companies, or I, I'm not going to call them companies, I'm not going to call them platforms, because they're, they're out there for profit. Um, they should accept responsibility. That's the biggest thing. We should, we should hold them accountable. Local media, like media in Slovenia, has regulation it needs to, it needs to oblige by. If we get someone that, um, if, someone is, uh, if someone's name has been misused, we are held, held accountable. If we, uh, if we put out information that is not correct, the person that, is, uh, that this information is relaying to has the right to, uh, to correct that information. There are certain laws that we need to, to oblige by. Them, as being over-national, cross-border, 
uh, none of this information um, obliges to. We've had a discussion with Marco um, uh, regarding, uh, for instance, Netflix. Okay, in Slovenia, you gotta have, if you're gonna have Slovenian content, all the content needs to be subtitled. You're not allowed by law to have any content which is not in Slo the Slovenian language. If you have an English movie, it's, there's gotta be subtitles or dubbed. If you watch Netflix, if you watch Hulu, HBO Go, you know, and right now regulation is catching up. I mean, these, these services are out there. They're out there, they're being used. I'm not a proponent of forbidding, I'm not a proponent of hard regulation. It's just that we need to set up a rules because the companies themselves, the companies again, not platforms, companies, are not willing to accept responsibility. Like Marco was saying, we had a huge issue here, huge, huge, huge issue. A murder was live broadcast on Facebook, a murder. I myself have done probably 30 complaints on that video, like 30, and all my colleagues, 30. And it took, it took him 13 hours to, to take down a video of murder. Like we're talking, not, this is not a movie scene. This is like someone getting beat to death. And if they're not willing to accept you know, responsibility for something like that or accountability, something's gotta be done. How? I'm not a lawyer. Honestly, I don't know. I still think there is, if, if we want the, to, to protect, not journalism, it's not about protecting journalism or media. It's about protecting the truth. It's about protecting the children from being exposed to content which is not appropriate for them. If we have this regulation for media in, in countries which is extremely strict, it's gotta be done for these companies, call them platforms, um, for, the, for the also. First of all, when we're talking about everyone can be a journalist, I think that is, it's, I, I would say everyone can be a content creator. They cannot be a journalist. There's a whole, whole difference between someone just creating content and being a journalist. I totally agree with, uh, with uh, Sonia that uh, being a journalist is a different thing. Uh, it's being reduced a lot. I, I, it's us to blame also. I have to, I have to admit that journalism mostly is about content creation and has been about content creation. We know that even the broadsheets, most of the stuff there is just content. It's not real journalism. It's content. It's, it's reports, which are, let's be honest, just reports. I would call them content. Um, and you know, journalism is a different thing. And also, the, the second point would also be that we need to, the media right now for the last five or I would say even 10 years has mostly been focusing about protecting its own position. Instead of understanding that if the audience has decided to consume the content or journalist, journalistic pieces of work differently, we need to find them where they are. I use a stupid example of, of New York 1914. Or let's, say, let's, call, let's call it 1912, okay? In 1912, the first cars appeared in New York City. Like, and I guess a couple of cabbies, or like a couple of carriage drivers, bought the cars. Well, the other guys that had the carriages were probably you know, looking around saying, well, okay, people wanna ride the cars, they, they, get, you know, they get more money out of it, they get more customers. They didn't complain about the other guys buying the cars. They saw what the customer wanted, where it was, what the service was it required, and they adapted. So we need to do that. We need to get rid of the old thinking of the only way we can transport the information is through broadsheets, TV, radio, internet, and we need to find other channels of getting that journalism, journalistic work that we do to the audience, because it is consuming the content differently. Okay, I would just conclude now this general uh, uh, so to say, illustration of where we are and what we are challenging, but with one, with one uh, last uh, remark, and it is hate speech. Uh, okay, we said uh, propaganda has always been, uh, uh, you have to understand, but hate speech is actually, um, um, I would say, a demonstration of the lowest uh, uh, sentiment of people, uh, which is also on the other hand, uh, notice uh, with the tremendous distribution of yellow press. This is approximately what people, uh, I would say, love to think, would love to launch and so on. But there are certainly limits. I mean, Huxley or, or uh, Orwell, but I mean, I think every sane society have to regulate it in a way. Can you tell us, um, for instance, in your uh, experience, because you are at the, at the so to say, uh, at the decision, um, how can you and how 
do you fight that? Because this is a very dangerous mm -hmm. uh, element for the society. Yes. This is also an interesting thing. We are responsible as a local media, as, uh, not local, but national media, as a media that is present in the country, we are legally responsible for the comment section. Facebook isn't. Okay, so I can write whatever I want on Facebook, and Facebook is not going to be liable for me calling someone the worst of names, threatening them, whatever. If that happens on the comment section of, on our website, we are legally liable because we provided that person space. So how do we fight it? We actually, it costs us a lot of money. We got to have, uh, we don't have it 24 seven, we have it from seven o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock in the evening, and during 11 o'clock in the evening and seven in the morning, we have the comments closed. But we have permanent presence, someone looking at the screen, going through the comments. Um, we get about 25 to 30,000 comments a week. Uh, the other way we fight it is also by just simply closing it down. Once the discussion gets out of hand, uh, our editors, uh, our daily editors, and uh, even my, me myself, or our, our moderators that, that do the moderating of the comments, they just pretty simply say, you know what, enough is enough, we're closing it. We had this issue with the refugee crisis. I did an open ad also then explaining why we decided just to close the comments under all articles regarding the refugee crisis. I got a lot of heat from, you can, ex you can think who, uh, about how we were limiting free speech and everything. The, the, the message was clear. We're not giving our website to people that are going to just attribute hate, hate speech. Um, we just closed all the comments underneath uh, those articles. It is definitely tough, but at the, also on the other side, is like there's a lot of my colleagues in the media that say, you know what, just close the comment section. Well, commenting and being open towards, towards um, your audience is is a new paradigm. Paradigm. It's 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 the way that it's you know internet has, um, I would say it's leveled off the status of the reader and the media. It used to be you know the media relaying the message and the audience being the one just taking it. The internet has also expanded in a way on a on a paradigm that it enables other people to tell their uh, tell their uh, tell their tell their voice and tell their ideas. So I don't want to be on the front also that says you know what. We, you've given us the internet because you were out there t saying stuff, and now I'm going to be the one cutting it off for you. It's a very difficult task. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of media have given up on it and said, you know what, we're going to just close off. But then hate speech just moves to other platforms. It, we've seen this with others. You know, People, instead of just commenting on our comment section where at least we have control over it, they're going to go on the same posts on our Facebook page, and they're going to do really crappy stuff there. Sonia and Inoslav, you seem not entirely to agree with that. Well, uh, the problem is not in the hate speech. It's in anonymous hate speech. We can't uh, cancel the hate speech because we can't cancel the hate. But uh, anonymous hate speech, uh, when I was young, uh, was limited to the inner uh, door of the toilet. Now, with the um, internet, we have uh, this toilet spread it all over the world we have, uh, because the hate speech is clickable. Uh, I faded myself from the portal of Uterny List because, because uh, I couldn't stand, not the hate speech towards me, but uh, the hate speech, for instance, towards uh, uh, Slavko Golshan, who died uh, um, several, uh, several days before, uh, ago, etc. Uh, maybe the solution should be liability of those who bring it to the, not only Facebook, who has a so-called command scene, uh, or by any other, uh, any other media, any other uh, social network, which allows in punished uh, anonymity. And, or to block them, block them at all. Because I don't see what those comments bring to information. The, uh, I really don't realize. Sometimes, for instance, uh, looking comments in the Guardian, etc. Even in Guardian, I, I, I find I find sometimes a, a, a real ugly hate speech. There is no need a hate without. Uh, uh, if you don't have any argument, oh, shut up. So now you wanted to comment? Just, just I completely agree about uh, having 
to have those big companies uh, taking responsibility for those comments and everything, liability. The, the problem about comment, I think, uh, in the internet age is that because it's so quick and you can, as you say, click it very quickly, if you read the comments, usually it's they talking to themselves, basically. It can be hate speech or it can be anything, but it's usually picks up a fight between the, the commenters, actually. And very quickly, it has nothing to do with the article or the news or wherever. So that's where, as, as newspapers or as websites, we, we, news website, we have a problem about keeping it open or not. Because is there a point? I'm not sure. It's the difference with the, the reader's letters which you get in the FT is people take the time to think about what they're going to write, even if they write it by email, and before sending it. So it, it can have sense. But the comment is just an immediate, it's the same as when you retweet what you were saying, Marco, you retweet a tweet, you haven't even read the content, but you know that the person who's retweeted it is relatively reliable or someone you like, so you're going to retweet it because probably you hope it's, it's a great story. So I, I would think that maybe the comment section should disappear. I don't know, but it's a big uh, debate, uh, which I think is, is quite important in, in that point of view. It doesn't, it doesn't add anything. And I, I would add the difference between betwe because the interaction with the readers is super important, of course. For example, it was funny that I came here today because my newspaper today is launching a new service on, on its website, uh, which is called Check News. And it's a fact-checking, but the difference with the just fact, uh, general fact-checking that we all have now, nearly all, is that we are going to check what the readers are asking us to check. So they're sending us questions, and we're going to check what they want to. We, tested that during the French presidential campaign and it worked because we had quite a lot of interest. But again, we're going to check what our readers are, are asking us, but again, we are, we are who we are. Libération is like the Guardian, we probably center left. Uh, we used to be very left. So of course our readers are, going, are people who are already convinced that we're not a too bad newspapers because they are our readers and they're paying because we got a, a semi-paywall. So that's the difference as well. Where, how can we convince or how can we give those checking to people who are not convinced by us or who are not thinking that we might be politically biased, as you were saying earlier? Yes, Marco. Um, in my opinion, I think that one of the key issues is that right now we have two set of rules. Because of globalization, we now have global players who have, let's say, their own rules. And then we have national players who have strictly to uh, follow the national rules. And then we have, like, whether it's Netflix or some other players who play it globally or within certain regions and so on, or, of course, even wider problem that we have with Facebook, with Google, um, and with, of course, with many other gatekeepers or intermediaries. Um, they are limiting freedom of speech. They, let's be honest, represent a potential threat to the, not just the freedom of speech, but also to the democracy itself. We now see the discussions whether Mark Zuckerberg is going to run for the US president, and if he runs, how he can use Facebook in his favor. Now, okay, if we go step back, okay, Mark Zuckerberg can be a nice young guy, you know, friendly looking, etc. But let's imagine for a second that some Russian or Chinese or some other tycoon buys Facebook. Would we allow Facebook to have all this power? as right now when it's some young guy in t-shirts from California. Would we allow a company based in California to actually have their own set of rules where we, you can either follow those rules or otherwise you can just opt out and you're out of the civilized world in a way? Because you have to follow those rules or otherwise you're out. The Facebook has a power over every media in this world. Remember the Norwegian newspaper who that was censored because of their front page picture of the, of the girl from Vietnam from 70s. Remember all the censored pictures from also all over the world. 
or other topics that were censored by them. Mostly, it was censored, uh, as always, for economic purposes. It was censored because their users in Asia, Middle East, Africa are much more conservative and they don't like to watch certain things. So they would object. And there are billions of users in Asia and many others in, in Southeast Asia and so on. And they would object, let's say, to pictures of nipples. So you cannot post a picture of nipple on Facebook or on Instagram. Even if it is artistic picture or documentary picture, it will be taken down very often, very quickly. And then there is all sort of... Uh, argument about that. So we have a tremendous concentration of power that is almost completely unregulated. We often say, well, the market will regulate. It will not regulate, of course. And not just that. If you look at things, I always use, when we are having discussions about regulation, I use the examples of New York City rules about sandwiches. They have three page long document about what is a sandwich. So what sandwich consists of and what it needs to have or can have, etc., in order to be sandwich and not something else. So how far did we come that we have this sort of regulation about something as innocent as sandwich, but then we allow somebody to say, oh, we don't have rules, we have our self-regulation. If you don't like it, you can always go out. And there was this famous video from John Oliver that you perhaps know about also not net neutrality and also some other things about these gatekeepers where he said, you know, did anybody on their cell phone look at the rules of Apple? Did anybody really read all the rules that you agree with when you purchase an iPod or iPhone or any other product and you get this and what do you do? And John Oliver said, oh, yeah, 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 you go at the end and you just click, click, yes, 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 just to get through. And he said, they could hide the whole mind Kampf within those rules, and you wouldn't notice. So yes, we need to end this two set of rules. We need to emphasize the, not just the media or journalists and so on, um, because these large companies are also getting the money out of this content from the, that is produced by. It's very important also at the level of European Union and the national to follow these new technologies to get a grasp of them and to, of course, update the national and EU regulation. Um, there are all sort of incentives, all sort of ideas and uh, initiatives from Germans particularly. Uh, and I must say I'm quite in favor of this sort of decisions. On one hand, and perhaps it, it is a media, but in Slovenia a, a magazine can have, let's say, 3,000 copies sold. But they will be punished because they have bad influence on public. And then on the other hand, somebody can write on Facebook, if the, when the refugees come to Slovenia, I, uh, I wanted them just to, the police to open the, the, the door, let them all in, and I will wait for them with a machine gun and I'll shoot them all. And that guy goes unpunished. The people who posted on Facebook that they would send them all to Auschwitz went unpublic, unpunished. I don't think that's normal or fair. Very important point. Uh, I think things are moving, even in the European Union. Let's hope. I would now uh, like that we move to this um, regional uh, versus uh, global aspect. Uh, but I'm glad. I think it was clear there are a lot of challenges, a lot of problems will be more and more. But we all agreed that journalism is not dying out, that it will uh, be demanded, and also serious uh, media outlets will be demanded. Um, the only problem I see is how they will be financed. They cannot anymore uh, finance themselves. They are asking uh, people to give, uh, um, so to say, contributions, and this is a big challenge. But one of the aspects, and of possible good practices is where we can distinct serious journalism and profession from amateurish and propaganda and hate speech um, uh, contribution is investigative journalism. This is something which can be done only uh, in a framework of a profession, in a framework of, um, uh, of seriousness. It uh, takes a lot of money, that should be of course clear. But it makes also results. Vanya, you are uh, doing uh, um, 
uh, I would say, a very important uh, uh, job. Um, uh, and uh, I don't want to make propaganda for public service or for commercial broadcasting, but at least in, in uh, radio and television Slovenia, it brought something new. Um, this is your um, uh, part of the story. Can you just in, in, in uh, short explain what is the AD and what are you doing now and uh, how much is this also uh, uh, binding? Because we all know uh, investigative journalism cannot end on the border but can end on a region because a lot of problems of crime and corruption are regional and not only worldwide. So uh, what are you doing? What are your ex um, experiences and what is your aim? Um, so <laughs> we, are, um, we are trying to, to go to some topics really deeply uh, and systematically as we did for the first one, like which was uh, health and, and this uh, purchasing of health equipment, um, just to look at the system. It is hard, not only it's a struggle every day, also in the house uh, to, to, <laughs> yeah, to get uh, um, uh, money and, and so on, to, to, to let us work few months without any results. Uh, and even then, we, we, we are not sure, we don't know if, uh, if it, it will be successful or not, uh, uh, how will we present it. Uh, it, is, it is really like when you start doing something, it is still really vague and you still have to sell it to, to your managers somehow. But we could saw from the, from the first uh, um, project and and also like also some editors and and people in charge could see some uh, benefit from this because they they did finances finances for for uh, 6 months without any anything in the middle any presentation or, or something like that and at the end we got really good uh, response like it, they went on for like months from uh, other journalists, also from other news newspapers. So um, uh, I just met uh, one that will be my professor now in masters, and and he said that's why he is paying this uh, contribution for for public TV, or you know. So. Um, not that okay. This is maybe then that the, the television had uh, you know something to say. Okay, we are doing this, which is it's not uh, doesn't bring us as much money as we put in it. It doesn't bring us back, but but we do it for the good of the community, and that's that's also our aim. And uh, of course, our aim as a as a group is to to point out some irregularities uh, and and to to hope that uh, something will then change. And with that, uh, we also went abroad, and we will go with other projects, not not just just to point out, uh, oh, those are problems and uh, and this this we are doing this wrong or corruption or something like that, but also to show what can we approve and what are like the best practices that we can learn from, from, I don't know, Finland or if it's something, then it's something else. Not just because, like in journalism, uh, as I was like hovering uh, a student organization before, like when I was younger, and I, I I just fell into demoralizing how bad and corrupt it is and how much money do they just spend for their own projects and something like that. And no one was then listening to that. It was like, yeah, they're all the same and I don't know. But if you, if you can show that we can do better and that this was proven in, I don't know, other region, other town, other country, then you can also give something that people can strive to on and, and then can demand also this. That's why this is also important, to show what's wrong, but also to show the alternative. Yes, yeah. and to increase the credibility and trust. 
because what yeah. we desperately need is trust in media and credibility, yes. of course. And that, that's, that's why we, we also did this web page, but it wasn't um, successful. I don't think many people went on it. But we, we like published whole like raw data that we got and, and also then uh, uh, the, the data that uh, we worked from and all, but uh, to, you know, to be credible, to show them we, we worked from this, we didn't just, you know, take this from, you know. It this wasn't this is very important. <coughs> uh, yeah, we have heard uh, critics on uh, Facebook and Zuckerberg and uh, types uh, uh, people of that sort, oligarchs who are also influencing in half of Europe uh, the public uh, uh, opinion um, and all these challenges. But uh, let, let's talk a little bit what can be done on regional uh, transborder uh, level. We are uh, facing uh, here, I think, also uh, maybe stereotypes uh, which, uh, which we should not accept. Uh, first, uh, 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 foreign policy is not only done and, and crises and wars are not only provoked in capital cities, but also on the borders. If you want to have good relations with a, with a, with a neighbor, it's very important how they live on, on, on the border uh, side. And I'm sure that despite of all these global um, uh, effects, and we can prove it, uh, uh, the atmosphere on the borders is sometimes very much influencing the, the global uh, events uh, and uh, we should strive that it would be influencing more. Uh, so uh, in ex-Yugoslavia, uh, in Oslo we have uh, also some bad experience because media has provoked a lot of uh, negative. Um, actually they have been, if not entirely, but they have been very much guilty for the, 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 the wars. Now we have a, another situation and um, uh, we are trying to come out. Uh, for instance, the dispute, so-called, uh, in, in uh, BRICS uh, between Slovenia and Croatia. Uh, uh, but it is actually not a dispute because I feel, yes, there is a lot of uh, bad temper, but on the other hand also people who are living on the border, they are keeping to say, well, forget about this um, global and, and uh, consideration. We want to live in peace and, and in, in, in friendship, and we want that this line is, um, uh, uh, so to say, promoted. I think very similar situation as it is between northern and southern uh, Ireland, although London would never uh, agree on that. Yes. Catalonia. Catalonia, all sorts of, of uh, problems. So, uh, what do you think? and it is also one of the items of this conference, how this, uh, despite of all these problems which we heard, and there will be more and more of them, and will be uh, frustrated, but, but still there is a chance that um, on the local level we can do more. What would you say? Well, I, um, I think that the problem, the, one of the main problems, is that we are not, or rather to say, our press, uh, press in Croatia. I'm not going now. I'm not going now to speak about the uh, press in in Slovenia because I don't uh, know so much about it in this very moment. But uh, that the press in Croatia is not reporting what happens on the border, but it's going to pick up the details which uh, uh, which can serve for the for the politics in the capital city. Uh, in our, in our relations, transborder relations, uh, often we use uh, to, how to say, to transport the internal quarrels, internal political quarrels and internal political issues, internal political agenda of the, of the palace, as we, call, as we call it in Italy, Palazzo, <laughs> uh, to the border. We are not going to border to see what the people uh, say they are on Bregana or, or so. Then here we have a dispute in this uh, part of a country, and in the part uh, in this part of Istria, we have a dispute uh, on the territory and equatory, which uh, was uh, which passed to Yugoslavia uh, with Paris, uh, with Paris uh, peace 
in 47, uh, where Yugoslavia made the ethnical cleansing. So that's something we, st we have stolen from Italy, Yugoslavia, then Slovenia and Croatia. And now we are, we are speaking about how to divide what we have stolen. It's disgusting from my point of view. Ethnical cleansing, uh, it was uh, terrible when Italy made the ethnical cleansing in, uh, in former Yugoslavia, uh, uh, after the World War I. I don't see why, why the ethnical cleansing made after the World War II should be, uh, should be less bad. It's not, pos it's not possible. Uh, on the other side, one of the aims of a journalist, I think, to show that that other, on the other side of the border, or, or the other side of the table, is not a devil, that is a human being too. But when we devilish the other, even, the, even our neighbor, on the other side, it's, uh, uh, it's, quite, it's quite easy to be, to be friendly uh, to people in Asia or Latin America. Uh, let's be friendly with our wives or our husbands. <laughs> it's more difficult, of course, and with our neighbors in the, in the same household. But uh, that's our aim. That's our aim to present the, other, the same uh, what uh, Sonia spoke before. Uh, there was a need to represent the European Union and the United Kingdom, and there is a need to represent, uh, to represent uh, Catalonia in Madrid. We have it. Uh, otherwise, uh, we know how, it, uh, how the quarrel begins. Even with the fake news, um, for instance, of Gleiwitz, but we don't know how it finished. It finished at, Hirosh at Hiroshima. Sonia, but it seems that in this quarrel between London, Brussels, and uh, let's say, well, uh, uh, Belfast and uh, uh, the capital city of Ireland, uh, it seems that uh, there are elements where the regional interest will be much stronger than we could expect. Yes, indeed. Uh, I think. I think we go back to knowledge. The United Kingdom is formed of officially four different entities, but the reality is it's formed of five of them. So you have Scotland, you have Northern Ireland, you have Wales, you have London, and then you have England without London. And if you take each of these entities, you have Northern Ireland, Scotland, London, voted overwhelmingly in favor of staying in the European Union. Wales voted to leave, but by a very, very tiny majority. And then England voted to leave overwhelmingly. Why is that? I think mainly it is because of knowledge. In Northern Ireland, they know exactly what the European Union has done for them. They know that it has had a real input into the Northern Ireland peace process. They know that after the peace process, there have been million, billion spent of European aid spent in Northern Ireland to improve the economy. They can see in a concrete way, they can see the difference. They can see that their kids can go to different schools now without being worried of a bomb or a, an attack or anything. It, and that's why they are so worried about putting a border or not putting a border after Brexit. Because they know exactly where where separation, segregation leads, because they've had 30 years of civil war. Scotland, it's the same. They've had lots of aids, and it goes as well to knowledge and, and spreading the information from the, um, the devoluted uh, parliament. You have one in, in Belfast, you have one in Edinburgh, you have one in Cardiff, and all of them have explained and said, yes, we get some more funds because we have a close relationship with the European Union, and that's what they do and don't do, and etc. London, obviously, because it's an interna international city, I mean, full of French, Italian, Slovenian, I mean, you walk around and you, you hear the whole world, basically, and Polish. Uh, so the same, they're perfectly aware of, of what, what is the, the world and, and the, what it can bring to them. 
As for England, it's a completely different uh, situation. And, uh, and again, it ha you haven't had any explanation coming from the media, but coming as well from the European Union, and that might be, and from the political world in the UK, explaining how it is. And so we go back to knowledge and explaining and, and um, you know, I was thinking about something, a, a very tiny anecdote, which might look like it has nothing to do with that, but actually, I don't know if you looked at, or if, you, if you've seen the, the Emmy Awards in uh, Los Angeles a couple of days ago. There was one of the sketch during the evening where Sean Spen Spicer, the former press ed from the uh, White House, came on stage as the same as if he was parodying himself, basically, from one of the John Oliver um, thing. Everyone laughed. And it was funny. And again, we go back to we need to entertain as well. It was funny. But the fact is, that guy is not funny. That guy has been spreading lies, real lies, from the White House. And the press, the, the American press, has been trying for months to say that he is spreading lies. And, and then we have there a whole audience of actors and everything who, are, who mainly haven't voted for Donald Trump, who are laughing and applauding. And then it does go back to our responsibility as journalists to say, it's all very funny, but actually there are real issues, as you were saying, behind that. And it's the same with Boris Johnson, where we, we keep saying he's a clown and he's funny and everything. But the fact is, behind that, there are real, very, very significant, uh, important issues. Uh, and, the, 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 and, and Boris Johnson was a former journalist for the Daily Telegraph, based in Brussels, where he was the one sending stories back to London, saying that the European Commission had insisted that you needed to have bendi uh, straight bananas and not bended bananas. And the editor would say, oh, let's publish it because it's a good story. It's fun. It's a lie, but it's fun. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get, that was 30 years ago, so that's where we got here. So. Yes, it's about, I mean, I, I'm sorry to repeat myself, but I really think it's about knowledge, and that's our responsibility to not be complacent as journalists and keep uh, remembering that we need, if we need to explain 10,000 times what was the Northern Ireland peace process, I'm not sure you know exactly what it implies. For me, it was part of all my <coughs> student years, the Northern Ireland process, peace process or, or the bombing of the area. For you, I don't know if you have any idea what it implies and, and what it is. And I need, and I think our children is the same with the Yugoslavian uh, war. We need to explain and explain and explain again. And as journalists, it's our job as well, I think. Yes. Um, what is very interesting for, uh, to discuss here would be, um, I, I follow just some, not all, local, I would say regional and local media in the UK. Most of them haven't discussed these issues at all during the Brexit campaign, uh, which for me is a, a bit of weird. I, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of local news. I think that in the future, local media is going to have the easiest job for them. I think national media and multinational media is going to have the hardest time surviving in the, in the future. Local media and regional media is going to have an easier uh, way of surviving. Uh, most journalists would, or editors would probably disagree with me and say, you know what, in local media have more pressure and stuff like that. However, they deal with content and news which is very, very, very micro important. It directly impacts my life. And if this is something I, I feel uh, as, a, as an observer, I'm not, a, I'm not a specialist in British media, absolutely not, but I've watched some British media um, especially the local ones, some local ones, before Brexit, and there was hardly any discussion on these micro-issues which are present and which should be discussed. And considering we're talking about this topic today, regional, cross-border, maybe inside a country and local, uh, when, when it comes to media, it is very, very, very important to nourish those, company, those, those media, uh, to provide them a, a stable I would say finance ground, be it through financing or I don't know, some other means, and to make sure that they survive because they're a valuable, valuable, valuable piece. Um, they provide information which impacts the lives of people directly. I'm not sure what the form should be. Should it be subsidies by communities? Should it be subsidies by, uh, by the government? 
I just know that they provide a very important role. If local media and regional media dies out, we're going to have a very, very, very hard time. Everyone will be, will be covering the exact same global issues. No one will be reporting about a new a local school uh, getting a, a new gym. Some people might think this is absurd, but you know what? This is a very, very important piece of, informa piece of information for like 400 kids going to that school and their parents. So we need to definitely nourish um, the way we work with local media. It has been completely neglected in the last 20 years. Everyone was talking about, let's make New York Times survive, what's going on to, with the International Herald Tribune, uh, Bezos buying Washington Post, and the local media hasn't been, especially in Europe, uh, given this much effort to. However, we can look to the US, for instance. Uh, in the US, local media is back on the rise. I know that Deep South, I know that Miami Herald, I know uh, the Times Picayune from New Orleans, these are two newspapers which are growing right now, they're becoming more and more popular. They've digitized, they're no longer doing stuff just on paper, uh, but the hyper-local content is very, very important for the future, also not just journalism, but the, for the future of media and for the future of our society. Denis, I am tremendously uh, grateful that you mentioned it because that leads us to our final round. And this is what we can do, actually, on this regional uh, trans-border level. Um, I would just like to uh, let you know that during these two days you will have a chance, I think, uh, uh, in the uh, um, places out of, uh, outside of the conference rooms to watch uh, some contributions from the um, trans-border project in this area called Alpe Adria. Uh, this is something which is very important and we would like to underline it uh, for uh, uh, keeping uh, knowledge of neighbors, of neighbors uh, culture, of our past, of, uh, of, um, of um, um, uh, achievements if you want in cultural and scientific and so on uh, field. Uh, just to tell you, uh, this is produced by uh, seven television organizations, public broadcasters, uh, from uh, Italy, Croatia, Hungary, Austria, Bavaria, Germany and uh, Switzerland. And you will see, I mean, if a project of that sort is existing 35 years, my goodness, this is one of the, not only the eldest European project, but one of the eldest in the world, because uh, you know how, how uh, vulnerable projects of that sort are, and uh, editors uh, would uh, measure it on, on audience rates and say, well, it was 4%, you, you should not do it, but it is going on. And I think that should be a good example. We have even a better example, and I would like to invite my distinguished colleague um, Antonio Rocco uh, to present you just short, but you will see then in next days uh, outside some pieces uh, of his project. Namely, everybody who is not uh, domestic here doesn't know uh, this was also a critical area, not only Croatia and Slovenia and dispute on the border, but it was more than a dispute in the border, on the border after 45. Um, and um, um, we had also a problem because on this territory, as in Inoslav already mentioned, are living different people, minorities of all sorts, Italian minorities on, on our side of the border, uh, Slovenian minority on the other side of the border, and slowly and distinctly we have managed via this, I would say, regional, local approach to establish a mutual understanding and atmosphere which not only in the past was one of the most open borders of Europe, but nowadays it is um, uh, really an ongoing uh, exchange information, data, motivation, and so on. And um, Antonio can uh, present you a model, and I would like that you just say us uh, some words uh, how you operate. Namely, there are in existence two public stations, uh, public broadcasters in Trieste in Friuli Venezia Giulia, which is the first uh, next uh, uh, region of Italy, and in Capodistria, Koper, which is uh, our literal uh, area. Uh, these two broadcasters are both, this is also very important, transmitting in Slovenian and in Italian language. 
local and regional programs. Not only that, they are every day exchanging their news in both programs. So the, the, the uh, news which is produced in Rai Italy is transmitted in copper the same day and so uh, the, uh, the opposite. Uh, welcome, uh, Antonio. Can you explain us what is your experience, uh, how you are dealing with local but also international uh, news, are you, uh, and um, what would you suggest? Um, kot pripadnik italijanske manšine se bom pogovarjal in bom govoril v slovenščini in bom izkoristil tudi priložnost, da je tukaj Boris, moj prijatelj, ki mi bo pomagal pri prvaji v angleščini, ker moja angleščina apsolutno ni na tem nivoju. A member of Italian minority, but he will express himself in Slovenian. He is not so very good in English and is asking for assistance. I'm glad to, to assist him. He is quite well in English, but no, no, he wants so. to be perfect. But <laughs> um, ne, samo na to, mislim, uh, prvo bi povedal samo to, da je tudi Boris Bergant kot uh, eden od glavnih tudi pobudnikov in potem tudi uh, uh, Človek, ki je veliko delo na tem projektu, ki se imenuje Čez mejna televizija, to pomeni TV transfrontalier. Ne, 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 Meni se zdi to pomembno povedati, ker pač ta inicijativa se je začela nekje 90-ih let, v sredi 90-ih let. This initiative started in 90s. Kot pobuda, ki je nastala v Kopru in tudi v Trstu. And the initiative came from both sides, from Koper and from Trst Rijester. In tudi glavni pobudnike so bile tudi manjšine, italijanska in... And the motivating factors have been the minorities. Prav zaradi tega, ker se je, so manjšine bile tako, bi rekel, imajo to potrebo tudi za komuniciranje z svojim matičnim narodom. Because the minorities have the need to communicate with the domestic, so to say, country of origin. E forse znak, morda tudi zaradi tega, ker pač imamo tvo dvojnost, ne, v tem smislu, da smo in pripadniki manjšine, ne, in pripadamo enemu teritoriju, eni naciji in potem nam verjetno to sodelovanje nam nekako gre lažje, nekako. And he thinks that because they are two-fold personalities, they are members of the minority, but they are also belonging to a certain territory. And this makes them much more available for cooperation and for, for this sort of activities. To ne bi bilo dovolj, če ne bi imeli tudi posluha nekje v, bi rekel, centralni ne, hišah v, v Ljubljani in v Rimu. There in, would be, of course, uh, possibly if there would not be a support from the central uh, headquarters like Ljubljana and Rome. In zaradi tega sem omenjal tudi tvojo, tvojo malenkost, ki pri tem je imela bistveno, bistveno logo. In uh, 1999. letu v Trstu uh, generalni direktor, uh, takrat uh, gospod Jarnes Čadež, uh, RTV Slovenija in uh, predsednik raja, gospod Zakarija, sta podpisala sporazum o čezmeni televiziji. So, 99, the director general of Slovenian broadcasting, the president of raja, signed interest agreement, memorandum of understanding, whatever you would call, about establishment of this transborder broadcasting. Projekt je imel morda ena širšo Mislim, želja je bila, da bi se to sodelovanje nekako razširilo v nekem evropskem duhu. The original idea was much broader, that maybe that would be a starting point for a similar sort of cooperation in European framework of border broadcasters. Dejansko smo tudi veliko delali na tem. A lot was initiated in this regard. Prvenstveno so poskušali predvsem vključiti tudi drugo sosedno, sosedno televizijo, to pomeni Hrvaško televizijo. We tried to include also the other countries broadcaster, the Croatian. 
Ta zadeva se ni potem nekako razvila v to smer. Ampak takoj smo začeli v tem sodelovanju med Trstom in Koprom. Tisto, kar je bilo zelo pomembno, je bila vzpostava... Kar je bilo najbolj pomembno, bilo bilo to vzpostavljanje direktne povezave audio-video med Koprom in Trstom. In to je omogočilo tudi takojšnjo vzpostavo tega sodelovanja v smislu sočastnega predvajanja naših TV dnevnikov v sosednji devželi. In to je omogočilo tudi takojšnjo vzpostavo tega sodelovanja each other's transmission simultaneously, not that they would record or cut or whatever, but when it is going in Koper, it's going also in Trieste and the same way back. Imamo na razpolago eno potencijalno publiko od približno dva milijona, bi rekel, prebivalce. They think that they have on disposal a potential audience of two million. To se mi zdi zelo pomembno. Tukaj je tudi zikovni element, oddaje so v italijanščini in slovenščini, ko si prej omenjo. In tukaj so manjšine kot neki, smo govorili vedno o kot most sodelovanja. In dejansko tukaj manjšine imajo zelo pomembno funkcijo. In the most important thing is that here the minority are playing a very important role being a bridge between two countries because these programs are in both languages, once transmitting in Italian and then in Slovenian. Pomembno je bilo potem tudi razvoj neke koprodukcije, skupnega sodelovanja v smislu neke novega narediti. But it was not only that, that we are just exchanging these news programs, but we are doing also co-production, that means a new value. We are doing new items which are separately, which are not part of normal daily transmissions. Nekaj primerov smo tudi posneli in dali na DVD, upam, da jih boste videli na ekranih. We can record it and brought some examples and I hope that you will have the chance to see that. To so magazinske vdaje, štiri redakcije, dva jezika, vsak mesec informiramo o čezmejnem dogajanju, nekaj, ki se dogaja na tem območju, nekaj, ki samo mi, ki smo tukaj na tem ozemlju, lahko poročemo. Nacionalne televizije o tem ne poročajo. These are programs, co-production transmissions, which are made by four departments in two languages, and they are entirely devoted to development in the region, what is happening there, and without any other element, but really the regional aspect. Leta 2004 smo tudi skupno prenašali dvojezično osredno prireditev ob priključiti Sloveniji oziroma ob razširiti... One of these co-productions, interesting enough, was 2004, where Slovenia was entering European Union and they transmitted on both sides directly and live this celebration. In takrat smo mislili, da morda je tudi konec našega projekta, ker se imenuje pač čez mejno, takrat so meje nekako padle. At that time we thought that it is the end of our project, because our project is called Transborder, but in this moment the borders have been fallen. Dejansko smo hitro ugotovili, da meje bojo obstajale še nekaj časov v različnih oblikah. Ampak mi smo hitro ugotovili, da meje bojo obstajale še nekaj časov v različnih oblikah. Ampak niso samo, meje je nekot omejitev, mi vidimo bolj kot neka priložnost. In dejansko vsak dan vidimo, da nekaj na tej meji, ki ne obstaja več, se nekaj dogaja. Ampak, vse 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 actually regarding the border uh, not an as obstacle but as a motivation every day is happening something uh, new uh, border in the old sense of the meaning doesn't exist um, prej smo govorili o prihodnosti medijev mi smo javni mediji 
privatni meri, komercijalni meri, vsi smo v nekakej krizi. In tudi... Vi diskaste, vi smo the matter of media, vi smo public media, but also the commercial media, vi smo vse v nekaj krizi. In ko je kriza potem nekaj režeš, nekaj izmanjšuješ neko dejavnost in nekakor tudi v Sloveniji v zadnjem času. In tudi v Sloveniji smo v zadnje čase, razmišljamo o tem, kaj narediti, kako naprej in v žal se dogaja tudi to, da se razmišlja, kako bi prav rezali te lokalne oziroma manjšinske, regionalne informacije. Tisto, kar za nas, kot vidimo prav na tem primeru nekega čezmenega sodelovanja, je bistvenega pomena. Verjetno ima večjo prihodnost, kot je rekel kolega prej, prav ta lokalna, regionalna informacija, če zmeni informacija oziroma regionalno smisel tudi mednarodnega sodelovanja kot morda neke nacionalne teme, ki verjetno bojo obstajali, ima morda na nekih drugih medijih. In unfortunately, when cutting is in question, one of the targets are local media, just opposed to what has been already stated and what is actually necessary, namely the local and regional sort of media should have, they have a future, should be supported and should be developed. In zato tudi bomo spet začeli akcijo o širiti tega sodelovanja, bomo poskušali to razširiti na nekem drugem nivoju, tudi na tej regiji, bi rekel, ki je za nas nekakor naravna ta jadranska, jonska regija, smo že poskušali realizirati določene projekte na tem nivoju in upam, da bo tudi ta bi rekel, projekt, ki tukaj obstaja in deluje in ki daje neke rezultate, tudi, bi rekel, spet bi rekel, tarča nekih pomoči, ker brez te pomoči verjetno ne bomo mogli naprej in predvsem ne širiti to sodelovanje. Vi plan to develop further this sort of cooperation, vi bi like again to approach our Croatian neighbor, but not in, in, in a, I would say, an antique way, but uh, maybe in a new framework which uh, opens uh, uh, with the Adriatic and Union in, in um, activities within the European Union. It will be necessary to be also financially supported, uh, but, uh, but they, they intend really to follow this uh, Tako samo želim, da si ogledate malo te naše oddaje, skupne oddaje in da vidite, kaj je, bi rekel, vsebina teh oddaj in kako jih tudi pripravljamo. To je redakcija, ki si se staja enkrat mesečno, enkrat v Trstu, enkrat v Kopru. In tisto, kar je, vedno govorim o tem, jaz od samega začetka sem pred tem projektu, morda najbolj zanimiva stvar, najbolj pomembna stvar je to, da se v tem sodelovanju smo ustvarili eno prijateljstvo, ki gre še bolj daleč kot samo sodelovanje na medijskem področju. In tako da je pravzaprav to največji rezultat tega. Vi bi želi samo izpravljati, how they operate. They have once per month uh, mutual meeting, uh, once in Koper, once in uh, Thirst. Um, um, uh, it is very interesting to follow these meetings. Uh, um, it's a mutual understanding, but even more, uh, it's pro um, produced also personal friendship and uh, trust. And uh, um, um, I think it is, uh, thank you very much, uh, Antonio, it is uh, really a good example. Uh, we just wanted to use this opportunity to give you uh, an impact uh, view uh, what is possible. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, our Greek friend who would also uh, be able to report how within the European Union, actually the regional and local uh, uh, initiatives also of Europe of regions uh, uh, is presented and developed. But um, uh, I think we are all invited, should be invited, should be in full of initiatives uh, to, 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 to develop that. Um, I'm still referring to, to an old, uh, um, in Oslo and myself are by profession foreign policy journalists, and we have been always saying, I mean, uh, you know, understanding 
between two states, even in old times, is actually uh, starting to be realized on the borders. Uh, if there is no understanding or misunderstanding or quarrel on the borders, you cannot expect a better um, uh, results uh, in the capital cities, but the local and regional can influence and should influence, and I hope it will influence. Okay, I think we have, thank you very much, we have exhausted what we actually wanted. Um, Magister Irina, I don't know whether we have uh, fulfilled your wishes, but I would like really to uh, thank very much uh, distinguished colleagues for their presence, for coming and for contribution. If you feel that there is uh, a special comment necessary of somebody of the present uh, 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 in, in audience would like to comment something or to ask, we are of course open, but otherwise many, many thanks and returning the words. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for this, I would say, very enlightening uh, workshop and to all the esteemed uh, members of the panel. I think we did uh, learn a lot and in particular for the continuation of our debate, I did put in my notes for tomorrow only few things which uh, I would like to, to repeat and bring with, and this is the education, because things are changing very rapidly, but practically on the educational side for hundreds of years we didn't change a lot. We still are very traditional in our education things. Journalism as a role of in education, bringing information, new knowledge uh, to the society, and also the transportation channels. And what we are in the macro-regional strategy is actually channeled with is first to provide the information, which is educating all of us on the regional and uh, uh, development issues, and then to find the proper transportation channels to reach our audience in a two-way actually process because we also need to know what is our audience looking from us, what are the challenges we would like to, to address. So thank you sincerely very much for this, uh, this, this panel. Yeah, I think we, we need to, to approve. Thank you once again and we will continue in the evening. Thank you.